praise the lord and welcome to the ccr youtube channel we are so blessed today to have in our midst father michael dikuna welcome father thank you thank you so much for your time and for being here perhaps not all of us know father michael i am personally been very blessed uh, by him and what he shares over the years and father is the current director spiritual director of the catholic charismatic renewal here in mumbai and is also a professor of scripture to the seminarians at saint pius the college uh, saint pius the 10th college in goregaon in bombay and today we are you in our presence uh, we're going to reflect today on good friday the crossroads of humanity yes um so let me begin by asking you not just for us today but for all of humanity gone by today and to come what is good friday what does it mean well good friday is uh, at the center of uh, not just christianity but at the center of humanity when we look at the scriptures we see in the book of genesis how adam and eve sinned and because of that the whole of humanity was punished including creation etc and so saint paul will tell us often that uh, the whole creation is groaning with eagerness for that day when all of us will be renewed in christ and so the mystery of jesus christ isn't just something for christians but it's for the entire humanity he is referred to as the new adam and therefore the new prototype of humanity and therefore his obedience and his death sanctifies us all it saves us all and therefore when we look at good friday it isn't just a a, a particular catholic feast a particular catholic uh, uh festival that we celebrate it isn't just part of the paschal triduum but if you really want to look at it for what it is then you've got to look at uh, what good friday does for humanity so we are not just celebrating the death of jesus but we are celebrating one whole event of the passion death and resurrection so the sacred triduum is really counted as one event from monday thursday till easter and therefore when you look at good friday it is the event that kind of changes everything and so this is really uh, what is important for us to keep in mind and therefore good friday is at the crossroads of humanity because now humanity is able to take a decisive turn a turn in the direction of our heavenly homeland and this really becomes extremely important for us uh, and so good friday isn't just a catholic feast or a christian uh, feast festival but it's more of something that the whole of humanity kind of benefits from past present and future the letter to the hebrews tells us that jesus christ is the same yesterday today and forever and therefore what jesus does is applicable for yesterday for today and forever and it's applicable for the whole of humanity and therefore everyone who believes in the good news is saved and that's really what we are looking at so good, good friday is at the heart of god's mercy uh, towards humanity god working out a plan from the beginning of time in order to really set humanity free to once again embrace humanity as his own children his sons and daughters and so that's at the heart of what we believe so it's almost like what we're looking at your hope exactly so good friday uh, paves the path it's it's at the crossroad and this crossroad when you pass through it you decisively move in the direction of hope yes. hope is the one thing that uh, no other religion really talks about as much as christianity yes. all other religions will talk about love talk about kindness etc but the hope that god himself will set you free is something that is exclusive to christianity it's a religion of hope and therefore good friday really paves the way for that hope which comes to us in easter as paul says if christ did not rise from the dead then our faith is useless what all that we've preached is rubbish and that's what we've got to look at so why is the resurrection important well the resurrection makes sense because of the cross because jesus died he rose again and that's why it becomes really important for us and so uh, the message of hope is really what is important for us father you know good friday sometimes can be a day for me i'm saying personally it just comes by you know you 
go to the stations of the cross and before you know it you're going for the service later but it's more than that and personally for you what would you say is good friday uh, well, I too have had my journey with Good Friday and uh, one of the things that uh, really I've grown with is moving from what you're saying of just another day, a day of celebration of the death of Jesus, a day of identifying with what he has done to kind of really encountering uh, what needs to die in my life and really kind of experience what Jesus has done. And so personally for me, Good Friday is much more than uh, just something that, uh, you know, we just celebrate. It is for me a life changing event and each Good Friday is a reminder that I need to grow more and more into the likeness of Jesus. Uh, we often, very often in uh, charismatic movement, we have this whole thing of the spiritual gifts. And we are told of the Isaiah gifts, which are the gifts of personal holiness that enable us really uh, to look at, uh, enable us really to look at uh, how we can grow into the image and likeness of Christ. The CCC tells us that it helps us perfect the virtues. Uh, and so when we look at what Christ has done, for me personally, uh, what matters is that every Good Friday is a chance to really enter deep into the mystery of who Jesus is and what he has done. And therefore, it's much more than just another celebration, just another liturgical event for me. Thank you for that. Now, I think one question for me and perhaps some of our viewers also is, why would the cross? Why the cross? Why did the father choose that it was the cross that Jesus needed to carry? Why is that necessary? Why that's, was it necessary? That's a very nice question and I get asked that often. Well, I'd like to just look at it from a perspective of how you and I deal with uh, our wayward children. You know? So very often we can, uh, we don't want to punish our children yeah. per se. You know? uh, our, our intention is not sadistic. Yeah. We don't want to punish them and hurt them. But we want them to realize that what they've done has hurt us so much. And we want them to experience that kind of anguish that they've caused us. And so we kind of give them different kinds of punishments. We give them retention of one way or the other. And I think this is the Heavenly Father's way of really showing us what we collectively as humanity have done to his heart, to his love, where he loves us so completely that he creates us in his image and likeness. And we go and precisely shatter that image and likeness and to recognize what it takes to once again restore that image and likeness. And so... I think what is essential really is to experience, first of all, that shattering. Yeah. Uh, very often if we read of original sin in Genesis, we don't think of it as uh, somebody dying for us. Mm -hmm. you know? We often look at it as a sin that has been committed and Adam and Eve are thrown out of the garden, etc. But the cross and the suffering of Jesus really enables us to enter into the precise emotion of what happens uh, in that garden and how through disobedience and through giving into sin, humanity really uh, kind of took a different path altogether. Yeah. Uh, as the Book of Wisdom tells us that uh, God did not create death, but death crept into the world because of sin. And so what does it mean to understand death? Is it just something physical? Uh, or is it something much more? Because the mystery of that is really explored in the cross. God tells Adam and Eve that if you eat of this tree, you will die. But when they eat, we see they don't die. They are in fact talking to God. So what is the death that happens? It's the death of a relationship because we see Adam hiding from God. And so when do you hide? It's only when you destroy a relationship, when you kind of uh, have a, a break, uh, when you break away from somebody. And that breaking away is really seen on the cross. Uh, it's the most intense form of a depiction of uh, the kind of sorrow and anguish that has that uh, that has happened to God. And what's interesting is that it's no prophet who's on that cross. It is God's own son. It is God himself who shows us, this is my anguish. This is what you've done to me. And so the cross becomes in a way necessary for us to really understand and comprehend 
what exactly we have done and what a great price has been paid uh, to restore us back into our original image and likeness. And so the cross uh, becomes necessary. It becomes necessary as something that God demonstrates his pain, his anguish, but it also becomes a way for us to really uh, identify with that and return to God. I love that you use that word, rest, restore us back and return us back to the Father, you know, return us back. Uh, we'll move on and, you know, you're also a professor here at uh, St. Pius the Tenth Seminary in Goregaon in Mumbai. And there are young seminarians in their formation years yes. who are under you. So, uh, let's... Let's just understand a little from you. How do you teach them in these formative years about the passion? Uh, yes. So first of all, when I take a course on the passion narratives, my focus is not only on the passion narratives, but to really kind of develop a background of the same question that you asked. Why did Jesus have to suffer? Why the cross? No? So unless you answer that question, why this is needed, it becomes... Uh, just an uh, intellectual exercise to start studying the passion narratives. Mm -hmm. You have to get into the whole mindset of things and how is God slowly kind of led us to this exact thing. Secondly, when we, whenever we study the scriptures, especially uh, when we study the gospels, we must call to mind that the gospels are not primarily uh, biographies of Jesus. No, yes. The point of the, uh, of the evangelist is to tell us who Jesus is not to tell us specifically what Jesus did. It's not a chronicler's report. Uh, and so that is where we enter into the theology of things. And therefore we will find uh, Matthew says something, Mark says the very same thing, but slightly differently. Luke says the same thing with a little bit of difference, etc. And so the same thing also with the passion. Uh, you must call to mind that what uh, St. John tells us at the end of the gospel is that there are many other things that Jesus did. But if all those were written, all the books in the world would not contain it. Yes. Uh, but these are written so that you may believe and believing that you may have life. And that's the point of studying, whether it's the passion narrative or the infancy narrative or any part of the gospel. Uh, we need to study from that perspective because mm -hmm. the point of that gospel is that we may come to believe and believing have life in Jesus Christ. And so when I teach them the passion narrative, I take them through not only the whole concept of original sin, uh, but I also show them uh, the prophets and how Israel has kind of uh, broken the covenant and why the covenant is important and therefore how does God promise uh, to restore things, uh, to restore the covenant once again. Uh, how he himself becomes a sacrifice because human beings cannot offer a worthy sacrifice. So all the sacrifices of the Old Testament are only kind of uh, a trailer to the actual sacrifice of Jesus. So right from, uh, you can look at it in Genesis itself, where God uh, removes the fig leaves of Adam and Eve and gives them clothing of skin. That itself tells you, how do you get animal skin without killing the animal? Mm -hmm. The animal has been suffer, uh, has been sacrificed. So that's the beginning. We go through the book of Leviticus, there are specific sacrifices for specific sins. As we go through, what gets more and more prominent is uh, the Passover meal. Uh, and the Lamb of Sacrifice. And Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God. So you can already see all these theological elements coming up. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we look at the crucifixion, we are looking at it not as an event in itself, but as something that Jesus did at the Last Supper. Uh, Scott Han and Brant Petrie beautifully bring this out, uh, Brant Petrie especially, in uh, when he talks about uh, the four cups of uh, the Passover. And so what Jesus does is at the third cup, uh, he kind of, uh, he says the words that we hear at consecration. This is my body. This is my blood. Uh, but what the disciples are eating is bread and what they're drinking is wine. So where is the body and where is the blood? Uh, the body and blood is, at, uh, is, is offered in the crucifixion where Jesus actually offers his body and blood. It is only then that the Paschal meal is actually completed because if you look at the Jewish Paschal meal, which consists of four cups of wine, Jesus drinks the third cup of wine 
and he says uh, says these words this is my body this is my blood and then he says i shall not drink again of the cup of the wine uh, of the fruit of the wine unless i drink it again in the kingdom of heaven and on the cross when he receives the fourth cup of wine yeah. he says it is finished it is completed what is completed the meal that he began there so when he says this is my body and this is my blood what he gives us is actually his body and blood and so that's where i kind of bring in these elements uh, i also involve a lot of the fathers of the church who precisely bring in these aspects uh, you see the early church understood this concept mm. and we somehow have kind of drifted away from it uh, not officially because the church talks of this in our documents etc but uh, in our understanding we look at it more as a liturgical celebration and we need to get back into the spirit of what is happening on that good friday on that monday thursday etc and that's why i kind of insist on teaching the brothers this particular thing because i believe that if the brothers learn this well then they go out into the parishes and they teach something that is correct they teach something that is uh, really true and they help people really understand not intellectually but enter into the whole spirit of uh, the eucharist itself mm-hmm. and so that's what we are celebrating at the eucharist the passion death and resurrection of jesus so if you don't pay attention to the passion narratives properly for what they are then you could uh, then run the danger of uh, looking at it only as a liturgical celebration mm-hmm. or studying it uh, in a very kind of uh, isolated manner in a very sterile manner mm-hmm. and uh, that becomes then you might as well study it like you study literature mm-hmm. and that's not the point of the gospels yes. the gospels are written that you may believe and believing have life amen father for us as lay people how do we understand the way of the cross uh well as uh, lay people we have this beautiful pious practice of uh, of participating in the way of the cross and uh, <clears throat> i think uh, the first thing to keep in mind is the way of the cross is not present in any single gospel so it's a combination from all four gospels right and, and therefore what the way of the cross this traditional practice has really helped us understand is uh, that we can really enter into Uh, the passion of jesus and so for example things like uh, the condemnation of jesus he's innocent but he's condemned to death mm-hmm. uh, the three falls of jesus right we can learn a lot of things from this even though he falls he gets up and moves on yeah. but sometimes we come across uh, people who are uh, constantly wallowing in guilt mm-hmm. and the whole point of uh, well i've done this i've committed this sin etc i think the way of the cross is a good reminder that uh you need to get up like jesus and go to your goal uh you need to recognize that uh your sin is in the end of the world but the fact that jesus died for you it's an opportunity for you to rise up and move ahead uh to the hope that easter brings and so i think when you look at the way of the cross and we look at the passion narratives there is a lot for us to learn i mean we could do a whole session on this but uh, we can't obviously go through every station but basically each of these can speak to us very very powerfully if we allow the word of god to really penetrate us and it can bear much fruit i think that's the biggest thing that uh, lay people can really learn from not just lay people but also we as priests and seminarians as well this is something that we should really uh, benefit from so in a sense you're saying in my sort of daily <coughs> life the struggles that i go through the things i go through it's an opportunity for me to identify and attach it to jesus and use that as an example so if i'm going through some struggle through that fall or through whatever i'm feeling to like jesus not just lie there but with his help get up is that yes, what you're yes i i think it's a little more than just an example it becomes okay. more of a reference point okay. so uh see our our entire life uh a spirituality is geared towards becoming like Jesus. Yes. He is the perfect man. Mm-hmm. Uh and therefore uh what we need to achieve is is becoming more he is the perfect image of mm-hmm. God, no? Mm-hmm. As Paul tells us. So we need to achieve that kind of image. That is what we are looking at. Yes. And so what is really important for us is to uh look at Jesus as a reference point, not at ourselves mm-hmm. or our sin okay. or 
our teachings because these are not ends in themselves mm-hmm. no uh, but jesus is eternal and therefore he becomes a reference point for us so every time i must measure myself up uh, to jesus and i must uh, i must kind of move in the direction of becoming more and more like jesus the danger is very often but i'm very happy i started praying now and uh, well uh, my prayer life has increased to half an hour mm-hmm. i mean what is that compared to jesus spending the whole night in prayer mm-hmm. but then again we like people but i love night vigils etc yes i am not saying but look at what jesus does it's not just prayer it's action it's it's feeling for others it's defending the rights of others and so all around you there are opportunities galore for you to become more and more like jesus mm-hmm. and that's really the challenge that uh, we need to look up to so jesus becomes a reference point not just an example yeah. the way of the cross isn't just an example of what we should do it is how our life should fit into uh, the life of jesus so it's something i have to really do daily it's not just exactly i would look at it more as rather rather than looking at it just as a pious exercise yeah. in lent mm. i would think of it as a spiritual exercise for the soul so to really kind of enter deeper and deeper into the mystery of uh, the suffering christ you know the suffering christ but the glorious christ who in his resurrection still has the wounds of his passion so both these are one event it's not something separate and disjointed right as he rises he also has the wounds of his passion and so we recognize that if we want to be like that resurrected lord then we must accept the wounds of the passion but not as an end in themselves but looking towards Jesus who died and rose again he becomes the reference point for us uh father you know taking from what you just shared you know since childhood i remember singing if you wish to be my disciple take up your cross <laughs> and you know it's a song that we sing and uh, we sing it a lot perhaps more at lent than otherwise <coughs> what does it mean i mean i'm going through you know the challenges of life uh, everything around me and even people around me seem like crosses yeah. and uh, so what does this mean to daily take up your cross and follow Jesus? yes i would think uh, i to get this question very often and people say father is this my cross and i often tell them mm-hmm. uh, well we need to be clear what the cross means here mm-hmm. uh, i am born with certain defects i uh, i have certain problems uh, is that my cross mm-hmm. no that's not your cross mm-hmm. precisely because you haven't chosen it it's something that is there it's an opportunity for you to grow in holiness and spirituality mm-hmm. uh what then is the cross i think the answer to this lies in the garden of gethsemane mm-hmm. where jesus says uh if it is possible take this cup away yet not my will but your will be done so he doesn't want it if he if he has a choice and yet he surrenders completely to the will of the father the cross is uh is hanging there between heaven and earth it's it's being completely uh it's completely surrendering yourself to god's will in that situation uh, and it's it's accepting it with open arms so the the cross isn't like okay i've got a problem at home it's my cross no but when i accept it as a way of reaching a uh, union with jesus then that becomes my cross so i may have a defect from birth or i may have a sickness etc it doesn't naturally become a cross it becomes a cross when i accept it as god's will in my life and when i use it for my spiritual well-being and growth so in this i see god's will for me and i recognize that i must use this suffering to move on in hope and to give hope to the world so the hope of easter really comes to us in and through the cross when i embrace this cross i become an agent of hope in the world so that's where you see so very often you say this is my cross and you find people very morose and like yeah. sad and downcast uh, obviously you've not accepted the cross mm-hmm. you're looking at it as a cross you're looking at it as a punishment so to mm-hmm. say but that's not what the gospel is really uh, Uh, mean by the cross it's not what it means to say take up your cross daily mm. see the words themselves take up your cross you know it's not like uh, carry your cross yeah. you know take it up right so take up your cross and follow me so mm. that's the whole point of uh, the cross okay 
it's 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 actually very insightful what you shared. It's it's making me kind of think. You know the word that you use, accepting. You know, accepting. And as you said, it's not a punishment. Yeah. You know, accepting. Uh, it is important. So I think we uh, want to thank you, Father, for this time that you have spent with us here today. Pleasure. Um, and for this series that is going to continue, we would uh, like to encourage all our viewers to subscribe to this channel, to share it if you have been blessed, to share it with others. And do remember Father Michael de Kuna in your prayers, his ministry, the seminarians. I'm sure they have a very interesting time with you, especially when you said about yeah. the passion, uh, you know, and how you teach it. I'm. Uh, I wish I was there, but thank you. Thank you so much for this, Father. We look forward to you continuing this series of journeying through Lent with us. Thank you and God bless. Thank you.